Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I think we are running out of time. So basically, I would like first, I would like to thank uh, Al-Fadil Ustaz Sabul Kani for his uh, very elaborate speech just now. And he has highlighted to us the importance for us to understand the issue of sectorism, especially in trying to accommodate the differences in opinions with regard to our understanding of religion. Meaning to say that he quoted the Aman Resolution that has been forgotten by many, uh, in fact, by even our political leaders. You know, when the Aman Declaration basically uh, agreed to accept the eight different creeds or eight different uh, uh, thoughts uh, of Mazahib in Islam, uh, including uh, Shia Imamiya and Shia Zaidiya as well, and of course, Al Ibadi in, in Oman. Um, but unfortunately, nowadays, if you go, if you attend uh, Friday prayers every week, then you will hear, especially in the second khutbah, that they are going to um, curse the Shiites. This is the current situation in this country. And I believe if we, if we allow this to go on, in no certain time, we are going to end up to be like Iraq or Syria as well. Right? This issue of sectorism is a real issue. And it is very unfortunate that, you know, we, I, I, I think uh, not long ago, a few months ago, there was this um, a moderate organization, a very good organization. I wouldn't want to name the organization, but because I used to be part of that organization in my younger, in my younger days. They basically, they had a, a conference or a seminar on trying to vilify the Shiites. So if such a moderate organization would be organizing such a seminar, what do we expect? from people from Jakim or uh, what do you call it? Iksim and so on and so forth. And of course, we invited them. We sent official letters and invited them to be here. I don't know whether they are among us uh, in the crowd, but we sent um, uh, official letters to invite all of them, including from Isma, Abim, Ikram and a few others as well. So without further ado, I think uh, Professor Chandra Muzaffar written, uh, I read his uh, abstract on this particular topic, and I think he had clearly written out a very concise assessment of the actual problem of what we're facing nowadays. And without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Prof. Chandra Muzaffar. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dr. Farooq Musa, distinguished speakers, <coughs> friends. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam sejahtera, peace be with you. I'd like to begin by thanking IRF for this very kind invitation. Sectarianism. is a term which has generated quite a bit of controversy. There is no universally endorsed interpretation of sectarianism. Nonetheless, I think we have evolved a certain understanding of sectarianism over time. And I would like to use that understanding as the basis of uh, our discussion today. Sectarianism refers to differences between subdivisions within a larger group, often accompanied by bigotry, hatred, and discrimination, and sometimes leading to open friction and physical conflict. Now, if that's our understanding of sectarianism, it is a phenomenon which has existed over a long period of time in different cultures and civilizations. Within the Muslim world, since the very dawn of the Ummah, there have been differences between subcategories, between divisions within 
the Muslim world. These differences have not always been about theology or about culture or ethnicity. In fact, if we look back at Muslim history, the first major cleavage that emerged in the Ummah, the nascent Ummah, after the Prophet's peace be upon him, after the Prophet's death, involved power and authority. That, I think, is something we sometimes tend to ignore. That that was the first major issue. It was authority and power that led to that cleavage in the Muslim Ummah. Right through Muslim history, theology has been intertwined with the question of power and authority. If you look at all the major issues related to sectarianism, this is the base. Power, wealth, resources. Presented in the name of theology. And this is true of the 21st century because my focus in my presentation is on the 21st century. Sectarianism in the 21st century within the Ummah. If you look at Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, Lebanon, Pakistan, many of the sectarian issues articulated via theology, ideology, they would be related to power, authority, resources, wealth. Let's take a long-standing conflict which is very much in the news, Syria. Five-year conflict presented as a civil war in the mainstream media. If you look at that conflict, what is highlighted is, of course, issues related to theology. Shias, the Alawites, suppressing the Sunni majority. This is the main refrain that has emerged from that conflict. There are not many people who would point out to us that this conflict, if you look at its root, it is linked to power, politics, and hegemony. We know for a fact that the Syrian government, together with Hezbollah and Iran, have been seen as the axis of resistance towards Western hegemony and Israeli con control for a very long while. And this is documented, documented through revelations from Western circles itself, that this has been their target. They have wanted to destroy that exists. And because in some ways, the Syrian leadership links Hezbollah and Iran, and their main concern is Iran, because Iran is seen as the threat to Israel, to Western dominance. And this is why they had focused upon Syria. The moment there was a small uprising in Dara, which did not have the support of the masses, it was very obvious, because the vast majority of Syrians live in two cities, Aleppo and Damascus. And this didn't reach, the so-called uprising didn't reach Damascus and Aleppo up to December of 2011. Because by then, the manipulations had become very, very active and organized. Those who had an agenda, who used violence, who sent in arms, who helped with money and provided intelligence in order to overthrow the government of 
Bashar al-Assad, who is no saint, authoritarian, no doubt about it, despotic like many other governments in that region. But nonetheless, we cannot ignore that larger agenda linked to politics, power, and hegemony, which was really the force that drove the so-called uprising in Syria. Today, more and more people are talking about it. But at that time when it began, not many people were prepared to acknowledge this. For Malaysians, the majority of us who are present here are from Malaysia. Yesterday's Sun had a very good article by Eric McGollis on this very question about the Pentagon and the CIA and their game in Syria, which had led to a huge conflict between these two arms of the US government. But there's something else linked to resources and wealth that is not mentioned. If you look at what had happened in Syria in the last uh, few years. And what is this? How many people have said this openly, that the Syrian conflict has a lot to do with a gas pipeline. It's not highlighted at all. Because the US and Europe are determined to reduce Europe's dependence upon Russia for gas, because they see that as a challenge to, well, basically US or Germany. They want to reduce the dependence. What they want is to build this gas pipeline from Qatar to Turkey, Syria, onto Europe. They've been pushing for this for a few years. The Syrian government has opposed this partly because of uh, its relationship with Russia and partly because of its own interests. Because Syria is interested in facilitating a gas pipeline that links the pass gas fields in Iran to Europe. So it is economics, wealth, resource that is the issue here. But this is not highlighted. This is the reason why Qatar has been very active in wanting to get rid of the Bashar al-Assad government. Partly because of this question of the gas pipeline. And it also explains to some extent Turkey's role in this, apart from other reasons which were more important until a few months ago. And things are beginning to change now. But these are aspects of a conflict which has drawn the attention of the whole world, which are not highlighted. Instead, it is presented in simplistic, sectarian terms. And it is seen as sectarian by everyone. The media has played a very big role in this, and so have the elites. Friends, if you look at the way in which real issues are camouflaged and concealed. It's not just in relation to intra-religious strife, uh, Sunni, Shia, and so on, as I said a while ago, in relation to Syria. This is done in other ways too. And we were confronted with another such example recently. We know that um, a terrible tragedy took place during the Hajj season last year in Mina. 2015 pilgrims were killed in a stampede. A very big portion, the biggest single portion of those killed were actually Iranians. 464 of those killed were Iranians. There have been calls for open inquiries, investigations, fair, independent inquiries from a lot of people, including the Indonesian government, because a few Indonesians were also killed in that stampede. 
and people from other nationalities. The Saudi government had ignored all this. No inquiry, but they did things that were even worse that has not been highlighted in the media. They didn't allow representatives from various embassies whose um, nationals were victims. The mortuaries at the beginning. Leave the bodies, which is really extraordinary what they had done. But the Saudi government has got away with this. You don't have the international media crying foul, condemning the Saudi government. Generally, there's been silence on this. Just a few days ago, the supreme leader of Iran, because it's the Hajj season, season again, made a statement about what had happened. It is basically a question of humanity. It is about the loss of lives. This is the issue. He wanted an inquiry. He demanded an official explanation, at least an apology. And how does one react to it? How does uh, the Saudi government react to it? Not by addressing the issues, by saying, well, you know, these people who have said these things, the Iranian leaders, they're not Muslims. They are the children of Maji, meaning by which uh, the pre-Islamic uh, status of uh, the Persian people, the Zoroastrianist link. Now, this is a blatant example of the manipulation of ethnic and nationalistic sentiments, playing the Arab line against the Persians, which is really rooted in history, and we know that. But this is an attempt to camouflage the real issue. The real issue is people have been killed. We want to know why this has happened. What are the answers? In other words, we are sometimes drawn into sectarian conflicts, not just in the case of Iran, Saudi Arabia, other countries. It's also happening in other parts of the world when the underlying issues are something else. We know that it has also happened in our own country, in Malaysia. The underlying issues are camouflaged by games of this sort, which is why I think it is so important for us to know what the underlying issues are. In other words, we must try to probe these issues from a perspective that is linked to power, to resources. They are more important explanations of what is happening than just a question of theological difference or issues pertaining to religious rituals and so on. Now, on this question of uh, Persians and Arabs, of uh, Shias and Sunnis, and the way in which it has been manipulated all these years, especially after the Iranian Revolution of 1979, by the Saudi elite and people allied to them. We have to be very frank about this. It was since then that, that this started. We have to take note of something very, very important here. Why is it that before the Islamic Revolution of 1979, the Saudi ruling class had no problem with the Iranian ruling class. They had no problem with its Persian character, which was even more pronounced at that time. Its Persian character, the peacock throne. They had no problem with that. They had no problem with the Iranian elite and its relationship with uh, Islam. These were not issues for them. They were very, very close, in fact. So you have to ask why. Why were they very, very close? There is a very simple answer. They were both serving the same master. That's the answer. They were both serving the same master. And the same master was, is in Washington, D.C. So they were very good, good to one another. But things changed after the Iranian Revolution. And therefore, you find that they decided to make Iran and uh, Islam of the Iranian type, inverted commerce, is a, a big issue. Friends, if power linked to theology, if this manipulation is a recurring theme in our history, what is different about the 21st century? It has happened before. It continues to happen in the 21st century. But what is different about the 21st century? Maybe because it's more widespread, 
now than in the past. But that is not what is unique. What is really unique about what is happening now in relation to sectarianism in the Muslim world is the active role of forces outside the Ummah. This is what makes it different. It has happened before, true, but on a very minor scale. But today, and I repeat, it is the active role of forces outside the Ummah as far as this type of conflicts are concerned, as far as sectarianism is concerned. Very, very active role of forces outside the Ummah. One can argue, if you're seeing it in terms of uh, political developments, that it began perhaps with the Ottoman Empire. The way in which various forces outside the Ummah, the Muslim Ummah, were actively involved in fostering anti-Turkish sentiments among the Arabs. Part of it was rooted in socio-political and socio-economic realities, it's true. But it was more than that. There were forces which really wanted to undermine the Ottoman Empire, which was already in a bad shape. But they wanted to undermine the Ottoman Empire, so they fanned, they fueled anti-Turkish sentiments amongst Arabs. In various parts of uh, the Arab world that was under Ottoman rule. And this has continued into the 21st century. If you look at what's been happening in uh, Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Bahrain, you find that external actors are very, very important. They have an agenda. And the agenda is to split some of these societies. This has been written about, especially after the 2003 Anglo-American invasion and occupation of Iraq. This talk that Iraq has to be divided along sectarian lines, that's the only solution. And uh, there are a number of people who have written about this, that this is the solution. Split Iraq. Suddenly you find that uh, Again, in the midst of the Iraq conflict, the whole question of the Kurds comes to the fore. I'm not saying it is a new problem, it's an old problem. Muslims have contributed to this, we know that, but nonetheless, the way in which it has been articulated and the way in which sentiments are mobilized around this issue, it is part of a larger game. Split countries like Iraq, Syria, a lot of literature in the last year or so about a solution to the Syrian problem split Syria along sectarian lines. The coast as against the western side and all the rest of it. They're active proponents of this. This has been the solution in Lebanon for a long while. Of course, the French played a very big role in uh, creating this sort of division, strengthening these divisions, and even if you look at the demography of Lebanon, the way in which politics has intertwined with the demography of Lebanon, you know, the role of uh, the French colonizer and how it has been perpetuated to this day. And that continues. So dividing countries in that region is part of an agenda. It is very much alive. Let me also add one other point here in relation to this attempt to divide people. Since 1948, there is an artificially created state in that region that is pushing this agenda. In fact, in some instances, it has actually initiated moves within this larger agenda. And what is that state? It is Israel. Israel is very much for splitting up, dividing these countries because their basic thesis is, if the countries around Israel are divided, split, weak, then Israel's major concern, its all-consuming concern, which is its security, its security would be guaranteed. This has been the Israeli position all along. And it is a position that was articulated 
three decades before the State of Israel was created, that you must ensure that your neighborhood is split, that people are kept apart, even though they belong to the same nation, in order to ensure Israeli dominance. Which is why it was Israel, through Paul Bremer, that pushed for the dismantling of the Iraqi army after the invasion and occupation of Iraq. The dismantling of the Iraqi army because the Iraqi army, whatever one may say, played a major role in keeping Iraq united. Just as, you know, the Iraq, the Syrian army plays that role in Syria. And if you look at uh, the Arab states, those strong armed forces have played this role in keeping a state you know, together. So dividing Iraq, this was Israel's agenda this push. And you know, Paul Bremer is an uh, acknowledged uh, Zionist, the first uh, consul in uh, Iraq after the invasion and occupation, Zionist. So this is the Israeli Zionist agenda. Weaken these states, keep them divided, try to destroy their armed forces. So that agenda goes on. The question we have to ask, friends, is how have the Arabs, other Muslims in that region, and Muslims everywhere, how have they responded to all this? First of all, I think we have to acknowledge that when it comes to geopolitical, geoeconomic analysis, Muslims are very weak. Very, very weak. They just don't understand these things. They get very excited by issues like whether that guy has got a beard or the length of his beard. These are the things that really excite them. They don't want to understand geopolitical and geoeconomic issues because these issues uh, are perhaps a little more difficult to understand, but they are the ones that really count. They are the ones that really matter. So there's not much analysis of this sort within the Muslim world. Nonetheless, it is true that Muslims have been concerned about this and they've tried to respond. They've tried to bring Sunnis and Shias together they have to address some of these issues, yes, and as Ustaz Abul Ghani explained just now in his presentation, there's the Aman message of 2004, 2005. It is a worthwhile endeavor, the Aman message. It brought together heads of government from almost uh, the entire Ummah and uh, more than 500 respected scholars. They all signed the Aman message. But that's about it. There's been no attempt to give meaning to the Aman message. No attempt to translate it into reality. Why have we failed in this? Partly because the vested interests are very powerful. The vested interests at the global, regional, national levels that want to maintain sectarianism, perpetuate sectarianism, and sectarianism, they are strong. We know that. And we don't seem to have the will, the determination to do something about it. Even amongst those Muslims who are against sectarianism, we don't seem to have the will and the drive to do something about it. And that's one of the reasons why the Aman message, which is, uh, as I said a while ago, and I repeat, a worthwhile message, it has remained largely rhetoric. I want to conclude, friends, by saying that we have to deal with the question of power. If we want to overcome the uh, dilemma that we are in, Muslims, we have to deal with this question of power. Of course, there are some people who claim to be dealing with the question of power. I'm referring to those who have chosen the path of violence. We're dealing with the question of power. Why? Because all those Muslims who don't like violence and who are supposed to be against hegemony and dominance and the way in which our societies are controlled, they're not doing anything. So we are using violence. I'm referring to all those groups from Al-Qaeda to Daesh and to Nusra and the whole lot of them, they are using violence. But this is not the way because it has made the situation worse. Their violence has made the situation worse for the entire Muslim world. And they have not achieved any success either. Because we know that given the power game, many of these violent groups are also sponsored 
by Western centers of power. They're sponsored by them. If you don't believe it, numerous articles have been written. Just look at The Sun yesterday and the article by Eric Megalis about the turf war between the Pentagon and the CIA. The US has been deeply involved in sponsoring these terrorist groups. Do they need uh, more evidence than what has been provided by people like Simone Mahersh? How the red line is linked to the red line? The evidence is there. They're involved. So those who are using violence, it's not the way. Because you can be easily manipulated. You have become tools of other forces. So violence is not the way. Non-violence, I still maintain, is the only way out. We have to struggle. It's going to be very, very tough, but that's the only way out. Nonviolent ways of addressing this challenge of sectarianism, which is linked to the larger forces at work, hegemony, dominance, both global, regional, national, various forms of hegemony. It has to be nonviolent. We have to fight sectarianism. We have to fight hegemony. And I don't separate the two in many situations. Friends, I think we have resources that we can draw upon. We have resources that we can draw upon. When you look at the challenge of sectarianism, don't forget that for the most of Muslim history, Muslims of different affiliations, of different uh, tendencies, they have lived together. They have lived together in peace and harmony. That's our greatest asset. If we have had clashes, they have been seldom. We have been able to live together. And if you look at the history of Iraq, for instance, the post-Second World War history of Iraq, we forget that Iraqis of different shades, of different religious affiliations, came together to fight against British colonialism. This is a fact. And we also know that in Syria, for a very, very long while, until perhaps even uh, five years, ten years ago, if you asked a Syrian what his religious affiliation was, whether he was Sunni or Shia or Christian, because 10% of the Syrian population is Christian, they would regard it as an insult. They would think that you're being rude by asking about their religious affiliation or even their ethnic affiliation because they were so united. Syria is that one state in the Arab world that it established a notion of common citizenship transcending ethnicity and religion quite effectively. It's one of the greatest achievements. You walk into the Umayyad Mosque, you have the head of John the Baptist kept there in the Umayyad Mosque. So we have our history, our past, our present as a great resource. And look at the religious teachings. We keep on saying this that there are many common bonds that hold Sunnis and Shias together. It's a fact. We don't have to apologize for this. This is true. From the Quran to the basic principles to the Prophet, these things hold us together. And we have what had happened in history. Very often I share this with people. I share this with my friend Karim Crow. And we have talked about this, that if you look at uh, even the theological history, isn't it significant that Jafar uh, Sadiq was the teacher of Abu Hanifa? Abu Hanifa was his uh, disciple. So one, the founder of the biggest group within the Shias, and the other, the founder of the biggest mazhab, in terms of population, as you know, the Hanafis are the biggest, the biggest mazhab within the Sunni population, teacher and pupil. So you see, there are all these things in our history that hold us together. But we have yielded to the forces of power and dominance. This is why we are in this sort of mess. So I think there is a way of getting out of this. We have to draw upon our resources. We must be brave enough to articulate this. We must take positions against what is happening. And we derive some consolation from the fact that those forces
from outside, because that's been the main thrust of my talk, those forces outside are no longer as strong as they were. If you look at West Asia, neither the Saudis nor Israel, they're not as strong as they were five years ago. In terms of their power, the ability to command support within the region and to command voices in Washington, London, and Paris. They're no longer as influential. And the best example of this is the success of the Iranian nuclear deal. That was a big blow to them. And globally, the US is declining in power. There's no way one can deny this. There's no way one can deny this. There are many proofs of this. The economic scenario is changing. The political scenario is changing. Ukraine, they're in a quagmire, partly because they can't push their weight in Ukraine. Crimea, they can't get what they want. And in the case of global economics, the rise of China. And in some ways, the culmination of that was the G20 meeting in China recently, where I think very clearly the Chinese leadership told the world, this is what we want the global economy to be. And we are not following your rules. I think it is significant. The world is changing. Let us be part of that movement for change. Thank you very much.